Hello everyone, welcome to the Voice of Faith and welcome to Healing School. Having your Bibles tonight, let's go please to the book of Matthew chapter 15. And tonight we look at the tenth reason why it is God's will to heal everybody all of the time. Amen. Glory to God. We are at a milestone. We began 12 weeks ago saying that we would look at ten reasons why and so here we are. And I have thoroughly enjoyed this time with you all. I appreciate your faithfulness for coming and asking questions later and taking notes. Tonight, the tenth reason why we know for a fact God desires for everyone to be healed. But that tenth reason, well, I'll give you right off the bat for those of you taking notes, is this, because healing is the children's bread. The tenth reason why we know it's God's will to heal everyone is because healing is is the children's bread. Matthew 15 and in Mark 7 is the same account of this story. We're going to look at both eventually, but we're going to begin in Matthew 15. And we're going to look at the, a, a very interesting story. As we know in this series that there are 20 individual cases uh, recorded in the Gospels of Jesus healing people. Those were handpicked by the Holy Spirit Himself put in the Word of God for us to glean as much truth as we can and see uh, the same results that Jesus saw in His ministry. So in Matthew 15, we're going to begin reading in verse number 20, and we're going to look at uh, the woman who came to Jesus and her daughter was grievously vexed by a devil. This story is familiar to a lot of people that are spending time in the Word. So the passage itself will not be new to any of us. So let's, let's uh, launch off tonight. Verse 20, pardon me, verse 21 of Matthew 15. Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. But he answered her not a word, and his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not meet to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. And she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Let's read, please, for the last verse again. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Could this story be a major key to knowing how to have great faith where healing is concerned? And I begin the, begin the message with that question because... Out of the 20 people that's recorded that Jesus ministered to, only two people did Jesus make this statement, your faith is great. The first one is found in, um, is in Matthew chapter 8, and it is the centurion servant. And Jesus said to that man, your faith is great. And then this woman here, he said to her, your faith is great. I believe that that is not by mistake, and I'm sure you would agree with that, that every, every word, every phrase in the Bible is put there on purpose. There's no filler in the Word of God. So Jesus said to the centurion, your faith was great. And the reason his faith was great was because he understood the chain of command. He understood authority. And when we understand our authority and submission to authority and exercising authority, it's easy to come into great faith. This woman, Jesus said her faith was great. But the way the story begins, it looks like uh, Jesus was mean to her. 
that he said some very rude things to her. But the story winds up with him saying, your, your faith is great. How is it that she had great faith? What did she know that brought her to a place of great faith for her daughter's deliverance and healing? Because what she knew, if we will know that, faith will rise for us so we can have great faith for healing as well. So this story really is interesting to me for that reason and for just the way it's laid out, how everything transpired. The first thing I want us to, to notice is the word bread. And let me give you a definition for bread in, in the context of what we're reading here. Bread represents deliverance from what torments and makes sick. Bread is deliverance from what torments and makes sick and healing from that which has been damaged. Bread in this story represents deliverance from what torments and makes sick, and healing from that which has been damaged. This woman's daughter was grievously vexed. So this, this daughter was not oppressed. She wasn't having problems with depress depression. This daughter had a serious issue with an evil spirit to the point the Bible tells us that she was grievously vexed. To me that sounds like and the impression I get from that is that this is a, is a, uh, a worse state scenario. This is not good at all. In, in every circumstance or every, every way that you would look at this daughter, you would think in the natural there's no hope for her. There's no way out of this situation. She has this devil She's being tormented day and night. There's no way out. But this woman, the, the mother, knew that if she went to Jesus, that was her, her way out for her daughter. That was the answer for Praise her. Praise God. Amen? Yeah. Hallelujah. Something else about the word bread, I want us to compare, since we say that healing is the children's bread. And this, this daughter was healed as well as delivered. And we know that because... The last verse says that she was made whole. That phrase is found in, in a lot of the places where Jesus ministered healing. And it's a significant statement. And there's a lot in that. When someone was healed, uh, the woman that had the spirit of infirmity that was bowed over and could not straighten up. When Jesus healed her and set her free from that evil spirit, he said that she was made whole. The woman with the issue of blood that pressed through, she was made whole. So what does that tell us? That tells us that there's more than just an evil spirit that has left. Whatever damage was uh, that happened, whatever damage was the result of that evil spirit, that physical damage was healed as well. Uh, any, any emotional issues were resolved. Any, I mean, just think about someone that you might know that's been oppressed for a long period of time with an evil spirit. That affects a person mentally. It affects them emotionally, and it will wind up eventually affecting them physically. They'll have all kinds of problems, uh, especially if it's a long-term situation. There's going to be some physical complications. And so this daughter wasn't just delivered from an evil spirit. She was healed because she was made whole. Now, I don't want to put more in the scriptures than what's stated. I don't want to try to guess and surmise what the physical ailments were. You know, that, um, that's not stated, so we don't need to go there. But I, don't, I also don't want to take away from what the scripture does tell us. She was made whole as well as delivered. So healing and being delivered from evil spirits, from any type of torment, is the children's bread. Healing is our bread. It belongs to us. But I want you to notice three things about bread and, and, and how this works with healing. Number one, bread is a staple. It is not considered an extra. It's not considered dessert. Bread is a staple item on the table. Healing is not a dessert for us. In the economy of God, in the provision in the table of, of the covenant that God's provided for us, healing is not a dessert. It's not an add-on. It's not an extra. Healing is a staple item for the children of God. Glory to God. Glory I like God. that. That blesses yeah. me just saying that. Number two, I want you to notice... That bread is easy to eat. And I believe that that was a major factor in her having great faith for healing. 
was that bread is not difficult. And she recognized that healing and deliverance is not difficult, but it's easy. And in our society today, because we've had centuries of tradition and religion taught to us, we believe it's very difficult for God to heal us. We Just like we have to beg God and talk Him, in, talk him into healing us. And healing, a lot of people struggle with that. But from God's point of view, healing us is as simple as eating a piece of bread. Many years ago, not many, like two or three years ago, I was praying in my office and seeking the Lord about some of these things and was talking to him about miracles and how to have more miracles and why we're not seeing miracles. And the Lord made this statement to me that really it began to open up my eyes along this line. He said, the reason why you guys aren't seeing the miracles that you long for is because you make it difficult. Where for me, it's easy. He said, you need to re every miracle, you need to reduce it to its simplest element and attach your faith to that. And don't think about all the other externals that you guys so add, or quickly add to it. Keep it simple. And so I began to, to think about different healings in my life and, and others and in the scriptures that if we will keep healing and miracle, it to it, reduce it to its simplest element, we will have, it will be easier for us to have faith and it will be easier for us to experience those things. So bread is easy to eat. Number three, bread is provided. So healing is provided. How many of you remember Psalm 23, 5? What's Psalm 23, 5 say? He prepareth a table for us, right, in the presence of our enemies. God has prepared a table for us. I always liked that. I always thought that was really cool because here you have the devil. You know, he's our adversary. He's out to kill us. He's out to do everything he can to destroy us. And we go, oh, excuse me, I've got to go eat. Right, just the disrespect to the enemy, because he wants us to go, oh, ah, oh, the devil, oh, the devil, oh, <laughs> the big mighty devil, when we go, ah, I'm going to go sit down and eat. Because God has provided a table for us, and on that table is the bread of healing. Hallelujah. Can you imagine someone, a, a physical enemy coming in to your house, and you go, Wait just a moment, I, I got some fried chicken, I need to sit down. I just got some fried chicken made, I want to sit down and eat this. We hmm. kind of take the, the wind out of their sails. And I think that sometimes we ought to do stuff like that to the enemy, as opposed to, oh, the big mighty devil, we just need to sit down and, and belly up to the Lord's table and have some healing. Glory to God. Matthew 6.11, Jesus said in the, the what we call the Lord's Prayer, Give us this day our daily bread. Give me this day, Lord, my daily healing. Daily healing. Now, that's, that's going to be important for what we're going to look at. Bread is a staple. It's not a dessert. It's easy to eat, and it has been provided for us. Healing has been provided. Hallelujah. Hold your place here and go to Matthew 7 and look at something Jesus said in connection with this. And one of the things I did not want to do this evening is to like look up every single reference to the word bread and didn't feel like we were supposed to go in that direction. But this one here really stood out at me. I thought this is one that we need to we need to attach to this message. Matthew 7, 9 through 11. Now how many of you remember, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll hold off on that statement until later. Matthew 7, 9. Jesus said, Or what man is there of you whom if his son asks bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? So in the natural, you know, my grandson Cody says, uh, Papa, Grandpa, will you get me some bread? I'm not going to give him a stone. I'm not going to give him a snake. I'm going to give him some bread. Well, if I am evil in comparison to how good God is, because he's totally good, if I would give my grandson a piece of bread, how much more would our Heavenly Father give us the bread of healing? Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. He's not going to give us anything else. I've, I've had people say, well, you know, when you ask God for one thing, he might give you something else. And I've had people tell me that, and, and, and they've said, so therefore, I don't want to pray. I go, what? 
Run that by me again. Yeah, I don't want to pray. I'm afraid to pray. Why? Because if I ask God one thing, He knows what I really need and He might give me something else. Well, that's totally opposite of what Jesus just taught here. If you ask for bread, what are you going to get? Bread. You're going to get bread. You're not going to get a stone. Right? How much more would God give us good things? Well, you know, now, we just don't really know what's good for us. Really? I would think that my grand grandson who's nine knows the difference between bread and a stone. He would know. And I think that we're intelligent enough to know the difference between good and evil. And if we're not, all we do is just go to the Bible. It'll straighten out our thinking for us. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So, question for you. Should all the children have bread? Hmm? Should all children have bread? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Then all children should be healed. That's right. If all children, if all the children of God should have bread, then all of the children should be healed. It's all one and the same. Glory to God. We are the children of God. Romans 8 tells us that the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we're the children of God. And not only are we the children of God, bread, our healing, has been provided for us. Glory to God. Let's go back to Matthew 15 and look at this story in some detail. Say it with me. Healing, healing. is the children's bread. Is the children's bread. Amen. Let's read this. Verse 20, again, 21, I mean. Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. But he answered her not a word. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The Lord does not adjust to us. We adjust to him. Jesus did not respond to this woman on purpose. Not because he was rude, not because he was in a bad mood. Jesus did not respond to her because she was begging. She started off with begging. She did not start off in faith. <coughs> Believers are not beggars. You can tell when you're in faith and you can tell when you're in unbelief or fear or the pressure of the circumstance because you will beg. And people that are in faith do not beg. Believers are not beggars. The Lord does not adjust to us. We adjust to Him. Humility makes adjustments. Pride makes excuses. Hmm. Humility makes adjustments. Pride makes excuses. Faith makes adjustments. Faith makes the necessary adjustments to lay hold of God's provision. And we live in, uh, our man of God makes this statement, I love it so much. He says that, that a lot of people prefer what he calls a no-fault religion. It's all, God, it's, all, it's all on God's end. It's all God's fault. It's never my fault. It's never on my end. And, and for, for hundreds of years, we've worked on the God end of things. And we should be working on the man end. God's not at fault. God's not making any mistakes. It's not on God's end of sending. It's on man's end of receiving. So most people's prayers is trying to get God to do what He's already done. It's like me saying, uh, Jacob, would you please get in the living room? How can he answer that request when he's already here? And so we ask God to do things that he's already done, and his response is silent because it's like, would you just look around and see what I've done for you? I mean, if I ask my son Jacob to be, get in the living room, he can't answer that request because he's already done it. He's already here. And so people who don't understand that God's already made provision, they ask God and they're silent 
God is silent, they think, well, he's mad at me, he's not talking to me. We need to not work on the, man, on the God end, we need to work on man's end. So, the Lord does not adjust to us, we must adjust to him. God is never wrong, he's perfect. He doesn't need to make any changes. It's we who need to make the changes. And when we say, well, it's all, you know, it's God's will for this, it's, his timing's not right, or whatever, we are in pride, but humility says, Lord... I'm going to make the necessary adjustments for this because I want to receive what you've provided. I'm convinced in going over this, this story that Jesus knew that this woman had faith. Not only did she have faith, she had great faith. But he answered her not a word. Jesus deliberately did not respond to her, but then, well, before we go on, i got to slow down. Jesus knew that this woman had faith. But she didn't start out in faith. She started out begging. I'm going to make a very important statement that's a, that is an all-inclusive statement. All that Jesus says and does in your life, He does as the author and finisher of your faith. And I believe you can see that real plain with this woman. I'm going to say that again. All that Jesus says and does in your life, He does as the author and finisher of your faith. Jesus knew in His Spirit this woman had faith. He knew she had great faith. But He's not going to respond to her with her begging. He's going to do things to get her to stop begging and make the necessary adjustments, make the transition so she can start using the faith that she already had. Let me say it one more time. All that Jesus says and does in your life, He does as the author and finisher of your faith. So, let's see Praise where God. she makes... Pardon? Praise God. Praise God. Amen. So, let's look at the transition here. Look at the adjustments that she made. She, she begs, and in verse 23, He answers her not a word. But in verse 25, she makes transition. Then came she and worshipped Him saying, Lord, help me. She began to worship. She stopped begging, and she started worshiping. Hallelujah. Praise, I am, I'm convinced of this, praise and worship is the language of faith. Glory to God. My spiritual father makes the this, this statement that praise is the big guns of faith. <laughs> and it is. He, he made this statement. I, we received our partner letter this week, and, and he said, that prayer is you getting into God's presence, but praise and worship is God coming into your presence. And I thought that was really, really good. God, yeah. And how can the enemy stand in the presence of the Lord, right? Can't do it. So she stopped begging, got over into faith because she began to worship Him, began to praise Him, and praise and worship is definitely the language of faith. And so she makes this transition, she's worshiping, and out of that worship she says, Lord, help me. Verse 26, he still doesn't talk to her. Well, he does. I'm sorry, he does here. He says, but he answered and said, It is not meat to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. How many of you remember back a few weeks ago when we spent two weeks on the ministry of Jesus? And one of those weeks we talked about what Jesus taught on healing. One week we taught on what Jesus did concerning healing. And then the next week, we taught on what did Jesus teach on healing. We mentioned three things. We talked about Sabbath day healings, the worth of man, and how to activate miracles. Jesus taught on those three things. Here is another teaching of Jesus concerning healing. From the, from the lips of our Master, He said, It is not meat to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. Jesus taught that healing is bread. For his kids. Healing is our bread. That's an important lesson for us to learn from Jesus. Look at the words again. It is not meat to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. I wonder, because this when this happened, it was in a it was in a house setting. I wonder how many people there that day listened to that statement from Jesus and they thought, that's it for her. He just shut her down. She is going home 
And her daughter is going to stay vexed with this evil spirit. But I want you to know that faith causes you to hear things that others do not hear. Faith causes you to hear things that others do not hear. I have experienced that so many times. Jesus said to her, it's not meat, it's not right to take the children's bread and to throw it to dogs. Faith causes you to hear things that others do not hear. When others see a closed door, faith sees an invitation to enter in. When others see a closed door, faith sees an invitation to enter in. His very words to her. To those in that room, could very well have thought he shut her down. He closed the door on her. But she took those very same words and released great faith. She said, truth. That's right, Lord. What you just said, that's absolutely right. Yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. If, if crumbs, if just the crumbs would do this for this woman's daughter, what would a slice of the bread do for us? This woman was not in covenant. She was a dog. That was a covenant term. Covenant people, the people of Israel, called those outside of covenant dogs. And she said, Lord, you're right. But dogs get the crumbs. I'm not in the covenant. But if you will give me just a crumb, my daughter will be set free. We have a covenant of healing. We've looked at that. So what would a slice of that bread do for us? We don't have to live off of crumbs because the whole loaf belongs to us. Glory to God. Praise the Lord. This woman's daughter was made whole. Jesus made this statement. He said, those who are whole need not a physician. Do you remember him making that statement? This woman's daughter was made whole, and Jesus said, well, if a person's made whole, they don't need a physician. So what would be the opposite of that? If you're not whole, then what do you need? You need the great physician. You need Jesus to be your physician, right? Hallelujah. Look at Mark 7 with me, please. And look at this same account. Mark brings out just a few other things in this. That's some pretty powerful bread if just a crumb will cast the devil out of a daughter and make her whole. Mark 7, verse 24 through 30. <coughs> Excuse me. Mark 7, verse 24. And from thence he arose and went into the borders of Tyre and Sidon and entered into a house and would have no man know it, but he could not be hid. For a certain woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by nation. So why is that in there? To let you know she wasn't in covenant with God. And she besought him that he would cast forth the devil out of her daughter. But Jesus said unto her, Let the children first be filled. Hmm. Let the children first be filled. For it is not meet to take the children's bread and to cast it unto the dogs. And she answered and said unto him, Yes, Lord, yet the dogs under the table eat of the children's crumbs. And he said unto her, For this saying... Go thy way. She took his words and saw it as an invitation. She heard things that others didn't hear. She took his own words and latched onto them with her faith and released her faith. And he said, For this saying, Go thy way, the devil is gone out of thy daughter. Back to verse 27. Jesus said, Let the children first be filled. Glory to God. You and I get healed first before anybody else. 
Healing belongs to you before anybody else because you're a child of God. Sinners get the crumbs, but God's children get the whole loaf. Praise God. So you get healed first. You are first in line. You get healed first. You don't have to wait for anybody else. That's something that I've seen that's also common. Well, I tell you what, if the Lord would just heal so and so first, I'm willing to wait. I'm just willing to wait. Why? Why? Why wait? If you're a child of God, you're first. In fact, God might use your healing before you know to affect somebody else's healing in their faith. So you don't there's no need for us to wait when it's on the table. And Jesus said, Let the children first be filled. Now notice this word, filled. Filled. Let the children first be filled. That's important because to be filled means to come to the place where you are completely healed. Completely healed. Let me say it to you a little different. Jesus considers you not full of bread until every ailment, every problem in your life is gone. Hmm. He's not happy with partial healings. He's not happy with you getting rid of your headache, but you still got back pain. Or, you know, your, your back pain's healed, but, but you've got a broken arm. I mean, it doesn't matter what the combination is. Jesus wants you to be filled with healing bread. And when you are full, all aches, all pains, all physical problems will be gone out of your life. Hallelujah. I like that. Thank you, Lord. Say this with me. Healing is my bread. Healing is my bread. It is God's will that we feed on healing. It's God. It is. It is God's will for us to feed on healing. I want to make these, I want to make these two statements back to back. They're close, but they're different. The first one is, it's God's will that we feed on healing. And the second, and this one, there's something in this statement. I'm asking God to give me further revelation. This gets my spiritual juices flowing. God designed healing to be fed into us. It is God's will that we feed on healing. God designed healing to be fed into us. That just fascinates me. I mean, that just pulls on me how God designed healing in such a way that we can feed on it and feed on it until we become full. How many here has ever been guilty of snacking? <laughs> Everybody, right? Everybody in America probably has been guilty of just snacking. Just kind of getting, you just filling up the corners, getting the edge off. And I think sometimes we, we might be guilty of going to the Word of God and just snacking. And, as opposed to getting a full meal and, and just really feeding and feeding until we walk away going, Oh, man, I couldn't handle another scripture today. <laughs> Anybody here ever been guilty of eating too much where you just feel miserable? <laughs> How many people walk out of church going, Oh, don't, don't dare quote me another verse, please. I'm full. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't that be a wonderful change to see people go, don't, yeah. don't even begin to give me another verse. I'm so full right now. We need to not snack. We need to just sit at the Lord's table until we are completely full. Glory to God. Say it with me one more time. Healing is my bread. Healing is my bread. Hallelujah. Interesting verse of Scripture for us that I believe will illuminate this even farther and further. Psalm 127, verse number 2. How many of you know that sometimes in studying one thing, you learn about that by looking at its opposite? Right? You think, well, all right, I think I got some of the concept down, but there's things in here. I'm, I just know I'm not getting all of it. And so you look at the opposite, and you go, oh, okay. Psalm 127, verse number 2. Psalm, Psalm 127, verse number 2. One more time, say, healing is my bread. Healing is my bread. Amen. All right, Psalm 127, verse 2. The scripture tells us, It is vain for you to rise up early 
to sit up late to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. Have you ever seen that verse? It is vain. What does the word vain mean? Hmm? It's a waste. Useless. It's empty. It's useless. Absolutely. It is useless. It's empty. It's, it's just there's nothing to it. It's vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows. Now, how, how would you eat the bread of sorrows? Well, you're going to rise up early, and you're going to stay up late, and you're going to do what? Feel pity. Feel pity for yourself? That's right. What else? You're going to think about it. You're going to think about all of your sorrow. All of the things that didn't happen, that should have happened, that made you sorry. All the things that did happen, that shouldn't have happened, that made you sorry. You're going to get up early, you're going to stay up late, and you're going to go over it, and you're going to rehearse it. You're going to go over the scenarios again and again, and you're going to replay them in your mind, and that's how you eat the bread of sorrows. Well, as opposed to eating the bread of sorrows, we can eat the bread of healing by thinking about it and going over it again and again. Now watch this. Watch. You eat the bread of sorrows by replaying your past. You eat the bread of healing by pre-playing your future. You eat the bread of <coughs> sorrows by replaying your past. You eat the bread of healing by pre-playing your future. You're going to meditate in the Word and you're going to on purpose see yourself healed. You're going to see yourself well. Replay or pre-play? You're going to replay your past and have a pity party? Or you can pre-play your future and get in faith and get excited about your future? The bread of sorrows or the bread of healing, the choice is yours. Hallelujah. Please, say it with me one more time. Healing is my bread. Healing is my bread. Say this with me. Pass the healing, please. <laughs> Pass the healing, please. <laughs> Amen. Pass the healing. Hold your place in Psalm 127 and go with me to Isaiah 53. And let's look at these two verses back to back. We're closing in here on the end of our message tonight. Psalm 127, verse 2. And then we're going to read Isaiah 53, 4 and 5. I'm sorry, Isaiah 53, uh, 3 and 4. Isaiah 53, 3 and 4. Let's, let's read these back to back. Let's get some revelation going here on this. I want to say it again. The bread of healing or the bread of sorrows, you have a choice which one you're going to feed into you. And I accidentally left, left Psalm 127. <laughs> so the concept of feeding on the Word is not new to us. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, right? But by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Paul told Timothy, faith words nourish. So the concept is not new. Physical food for the physical man. Spiritual food for the spiritual man. Alright, here we go. Psalm 127, verse 2. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. Isaiah 53. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of what? Sorrow. Sorrows. Sorrows. Now, Hebrews chapter 1 tells us that Jesus was the most joyful man that ever lived on planet earth. Okay, No one had more joy than Jesus. And I believe that was one of the main things that drew little kids to him. I mean, little kids don't like to hang around sourpusses. Jesus was smiling. He had a twinkle in his eye. He was laughing. Jesus was magnetic because of his joy. I, I encourage you later on tonight or this week, Read Hebrews chapter 1 and, and learn about how Jesus had more joy than anybody else. And yet here it says that he was despised and rejected of men, 
a man of sorrows. All right? Now, how's that possible? Watch this. And acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Jesus did not have any sorrows. He became sorrowful when he took ours. He was the most joyful man that ever lived on planet earth. And yet he became sorry and sorrowful with our sorrow. He took, he bore, he carried away our sorrows. Hallelujah. Now, here is my question with that. <laughs> When are we going to take this serious? Jesus took your bread of sorrows and he gave you a healing loaf. When are we going to accept that part of our redemption, a big part, is that Jesus wants you and I to never have another sad day? He does not want us experiencing sorrow because just like he took your sins and your sicknesses, he took your sorrows so you could have His joy. He took your sin. He gave you His righteousness. He took your sickness and disease. He gave you health and healing. He took your sorrow and He gave you His joy. We should have no more sad days. When are we going to take this serious and begin to apply our faith that I don't have to be filled with sorrow. That Jesus bore it. He took it away from me. I want to say it again. Jesus took your bread of sorrows and He gave you a healing loaf. Praise God. I'm thankful that we have a choice between the bread of sorrows or the bread of healing. And the Lord wants us to reject the bread of sorrows, take the bread of healing, and He wants us to feed specifically on healing until there's nothing wrong with us, that there's no ailments, there's no infirmities, there's no weaknesses in our body or in our life. Amen. Hallelujah. Children right. should come to the table and eat because it belongs to us. Healing is the children's bread. And that's why it's God's will for all to be healed. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you for watching The Voice of Faith. Pray this message has been a blessing to you. Until next time, remember what Jesus said in Mark chapter 5, Be not afraid, only believe.